expressed. So we are talking on the basis that they did it. Period. Assuming, okay? Why did they do it? The only story that's circulating out there that the older brother went to Dagestan and we know, well, that's what they tell us, that he became more Muslim. He became, he wanted to be closer to his religion. And that's how he got radicalized. Let's take that. Let's take that he became more Muslim. What do you know about Muslims and war? What do you know about Muslim and killings? What does Islam say? If you got closer to Islam, then Islam tells you when to kill and who to kill. We're going to show you a little screen and we'll go over it. The rules of, of, of war. This is what Muhammad, peace be upon him, the prophet of the Almighty God, this is what he told his soldiers going into battle. He told them, do not, don't ever kill women. In battle, we're not talking about, not in battle, we're not talking about in a city. We're not talking about if you go on a crowded street, this is when they were going to war. Saying, even in war, do not kill women. Don't kill children and old people. Don't burn houses of worship of other religions. Don't cut or destroy and burn trees. Don't tear down any buildings. Don't persecute animals. Don't kill animals. Don't burn a nest of bees and scatter them. Don't be treacherous and don't be a coward. Now come back to me. Okay. What I want to concentrate on two things. Number one, that was rules of engagement in a war. In a war. Now the street of Boston, that was not a battlefield. An eight-year-old died in that bombing. So if we assume that those two are the bombers, they were not following Islamic teachings. On the contrary, they were sinning against Islam. You cannot kill innocent people. Even soldiers in battle, on the battlefield, if you are fighting them, if they drop their weapons, you cannot kill them. That's it. If they drop their weapons, that's it. You stop. What about people on the streets of Boston, children, little children, women, old people, going out there to enjoy the marathon? Has anyone of these like stations like Sean Hannity or O'Reilly or anyone talked about that? Well, wait a minute. If this guy became more Muslim, which means he knows about Islam, and you want to know something? Everybody, this, you know, what I just read to you, that's elementary in the Muslim religion. That's not like you really have to be so into the religion to learn that. That's elementary. That's elementary. Every Muslim knows that killing an innocent soul, and that's what God Almighty said in the Quran. Killing an innocent soul, it's like killing the whole of humanity. All those were innocent, the three that died. All of them, they were innocent. They were not soldier on a battlefield. So if these two brothers, because they became more Muslims, which I doubt it. I doubt it. 
And then they're Chechens. Well, you never heard of that. I've been knowing Chechnya and Chechens for a long, long time because actually we have in the Middle East, we have Chechen refugees who came to many countries in the Middle East in the early part of the 20th century as refugees because they were religiously persecuted by the communists. Because remember, Chechnya became part of the Soviet Union. Dagestan, majority Muslims, it became part of the Soviet Union. Now, Chechnya, at the breakup of the Soviet Union, it wanted to secede from just like uh, 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 other states. You know, like Ukraine, Georgia, uh, uh, Lithuania, whatever. All of these old Soviet Union republics, they were able to break away. Well, Chechnya was one of those republics that actually wanted to break away. And it has been having a war with the Russians since the breakup of the Soviet republics, of the Soviet Union. Why am I telling you this? Well, I'm telling you this because the United States happened to be on the side of the Muslims in that uh, 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 battle with the Russians. You know, big powers. Now, the United States, through the CIA, helping the Chechen rebels, actually, against the Russians, and they've been helping them for a long, long time. So there is a good relationship. Now, why is the United States doing that? Well, it's just, you know, that's what superpowers do. They kind of like to mess with each other so they can have, uh, uh, I guess, spots of influence that they can use. So they can use the Chechen card with the Russians. And the Russians can use the Syrian cards with the Americans. And the Russians use the Libyans, the Iranians. So these superpowers, they do have, and they, and they do that. Because that's how you compete with the other guy. So the CIA actually is on the side of the Chechens. So the last thing a Chechen wants to do is to jeopardize the relationship that his people and his cause is having with the people who support him or the government that supports him. Because you really, you know, as people, you had no clue that there was even Chechnya out there or what the heck is a Chechen is. Now, we are told that back in 2011, the Russians told the FBI, look, you got to be careful. This guy's this and this guy's that. And there are also reports in 2012 that actually the Saudi Arabians did the same thing and said, look, you got a loose cannon there. In 2012, we know that he went to Dagestan. And if you listen to the news media, I was listening to CNN and they had uh, uh, Giuliani on there. To me, he's a bigot. These are, these are the vouchers that they come out uh, 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 basically scavenger hunters and every other word coming out of their uh, mouths or his mouth and everybody else on TV is Muslims oh yeah they hate us they hate us they want to kill us now we know in 2012 when he went when the older brother Tamerlane when he went to Dagestan, and then they were saying, well, he went to Dagestan. Well, he went to Dagestan because his parents lived there. His parents fled the uh, uh, Chechnya because it's war-torn, and they went next door into Dagestan, and that's where they have been living. So now, and we also know that in 2012, he actually went and participated in a CIA-sponsored conference in Dagestan. Yes, Tamerlan, the, the older brother who died is actually 
was actually a participant in a CIA-sponsored conference in Dagestan. Now, that's a fact. That's a fact. It is, it's not like uh, uh, this is conspiracy or anything. No, that's a fact. So why would this Chechen, who wanted to be a boxer, who wanted to be part of the United States Olympic team, and who has a three-year-old daughter, we know he's not the Muslim that everybody is trying to make him to be. And if he was, he would not have done what he did because he would know better. Because killing children is prohibited in Islam. Killing innocent people is prohibited in Islam. Destroying buildings is prohibited in Islam. But yet he did all that, supposedly. Now, we don't know if he did it or not. We don't know. We don't have the whole story. But like I said, we are going with the basis that, yes, him and his brother, they did it. Well, if they did it, they did not do it because they're Muslims. If they did it, they did it because they were crazy. Or they had a different motive that we don't know. Now, did the FBI actually, did they have, you know, you remember the FBI, and we talked about this, and every time the FBI catches a terrorist wanting to do bombings, we, we've talked about this, uh, about all of them, on this program and in every one we told you that the FBI that was the one that actually created those episodes remember the pilotless planes that were supposed to be flown into the uh, uh, the Pentagon remember the uh, Times Square bomber remember remember all of them it turned out that the FBI was actually who created that plot they found some guy who thinks maybe he doesn't like the United States of what the United States is doing overseas and you can find a lot of people like that now that's how they think now if we live in the United States we should respect each other's opinions and there are many people who are not Muslims who disagreed with the war on Iraq, with the war in Afghanistan, with the, with the endless wars that the United States government is undertaking in many parts of the world. Now, that's what a free country is supposed to be. People debating ideas freely. So what the FBI did actually is they went, they found those people who think the United States is a bad guy for doing what it's doing around the world and they nurtured these thoughts they got other people to get involved that these people can be comfortable with and they started the plot and you know we don't know how many did the FBI actually try with to to do about 20 of them in the last 10 years Maybe they tried about a couple of hundred people and they got 20 to actually go along with it. Now, did Tamerlan was one of those people? You know, the FBI have used also the citizenship deal. You know, many people, when they come here, they become citizens. Some of them, they run into hurdles to become a citizen. And becoming a citizen is a big thing. Now, this guy actually wanted to be a citizen of the United States. He wanted it so bad. But the immigration, uh, uh, the immigration and naturalization office said no. Why? Because he had beaten up his ex-girlfriend. And that's on his records, that he had beaten up domestic abuse. And we're not going to give it to you. Even though he's married to an American citizen and he has a child and he's been living here for 10 years, they've given him a hard time. Now, sometimes they're going to give you even more of a hard time. And then the FBI comes in and says, hey, look, we can help you with that. But you got to give us something. You got to work with us. Was there a deal between the FBI? Because the FBI have been warned by the Russians. They have been warned by the Saudis. 
They have talked to him as, as late as 2012. And we don't know if when he came back, he was debriefed at the airport or not. We don't know. We don't know if there was a case officer actually assigned to Tamerlan to follow up with him. We don't know if there was actually a real FBI plot that went bad. We don't know. We don't know. Did the FBI, did, it, did they know? Did the FBI tell them through third parties? We don't know. Because sometimes the FBI would create its own terrorists so they can catch them. And I'm not saying that just because we're going to show you a little clip that's going to actually, and I'm sure you will believe the people on the uh, on these clips that uh, the FBI, yeah, it was involved in the uh, in some of these things. Um, let's go ahead and play the. Um, I think it's the longest clip that we have there with the FBI and. Uh, um, could they, were they, uh, could, could they have been involved in that? We don't know. But we know one thing. They were involved in the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center. It was supposed to be fake bombs, but then something happened. We're not going to go through uh, uh, the details of 1993. It's all over the Internet. It's facts now. You can go and read it and, and see what role did the FBI play in the 1993 uh, Twin Tower bombings. Now, we're not telling you anything. I'm not telling you that's what happened. I'm not telling you that the FBI was actually involved in the Boston. I'm not telling you that. We will hear Judge, um, uh, I think, Natapoliano uh, on, uh, on, on the Fox network. Um, you know, we always, we always cover that, but I was actually surprised and it's been it's been a while since he did this, but uh, mainstream media actually uh, they're talking about it now. So let's go ahead and play that video. Pay attention. Learning more tonight about the Boston Marathon bombing, and yet there are still so many questions that have not been answered. The biggest one, of course, is who's behind it. Ben is looking back at some recent history in order to look forward in a reality check you won't see anywhere else. In what has become the first terror bombing or explosion in the U.S. since 9 11, the biggest question tonight is who is responsible? Tonight we know more about what happened. The explosives used in this deadly Boston Marathon bombing were contained in 1.6 gallon pressure cookers hidden in black duffel bags on the ground. A person briefed on the investigation told that to the Associated Press. Now one of the explosives contained shards of metal and ball bearings. Another contained nails. Those two bombs blew up about 10 seconds apart Monday, tearing off victims' limbs and leaving the streets spattered with blood and strewn with broken glass. Three people were killed, including an eight-year-old boy. More than 170 people were wounded. So the big question that has not been answered yet is who is behind these attacks? So far, the FBI has questioned a Saudi national and has searched his apartment but found no signs of evidence against him. No groups have come forward claiming responsibility. And tonight, intelligence officials say they do not believe this was an Al-Qaeda plot. So who was behind it? Well, no one knows at this point, or at least no one is saying. The last time the U.S. saw a bombing attempt like this was 1993. It was during the World Trade Center bombing. That explosion left six people dead, more than a thousand injured. Damages in excess of half a billion dollars. But there is a part of the World Trade Center bombings that is severely underreported that it was the FBI presiding over the terrorists who carried out the 1993 bombing. In fact, virtually no one would know that fact today had it not been for this man, Imad A. Salim, a 43-year-old former Egyptian army officer. He was used by our government to penetrate a circle of Muslim extremists. 
According to extensive reporting by the New York Times, Mr. Salim secretly recorded hundreds of hours of conversations with the feds. Again, according to the Times, law enforcement officials were told the terrorists were building a bomb that was eventually used to blow up the World Trade Center. They planned to thwart the plotters by secretly substituting harmless powder for the explosives. The informer was to have helped the plotters build the bomb and supply the fake powder, but the plan was called off by an FBI supervisor. The account portrays the authorities as in a far better position than previously known to foil the February 26 bombing of New York City's tallest towers. Well, what this means for you, again tonight, we know very little about what happened. But we do know this. The University of Mobile's cross-country coach told a local TV affiliate that he was near the finish line of the Boston Marathon when the explosions went off. He said he thought it was odd that there were bomb-sniffing dogs at both the start and the finish lines. He also said that law enforcement spotters were on the roofs at the start and end of the race. So the question tonight must be asked. Did the FBI have any knowledge of this plot before it happened? We do know for a fact that dozens of times since 9-11, the FBI has recruited, trained, and then taken down suspected terrorists before they could carry out their plots. That's not conspiracy, that's a fact. Is the practice of the FBI creating terror plots only to break them up before they can actually happen really making us safer? Is that what happened here? And that is Reality Check. Does the government work for us or do we work for the government? Can the federal government take credit for saving us from a plot of its own creation? Tonight, has the federal government kept us safe or does it just want us to think that it has kept us safe? Since the tragedy of 9-11, numerous crazies and low-level copycats have engaged in criminal behavior which they hoped would result in the deaths, the deaths of innocent Americans and somehow advance their cause of jihad. If you ask the leadership of the FBI, most of whose field agents are tireless, dedicated, constitution-supporting professionals, it will tell you that it, the FBI, has foiled about 17 plots to kill Americans during the past 10 years. What it will not tell you is that there have been 20 foiled plots, and of them, three were interrupted by members of the public. The 17 that were interrupted by the feds were created by the feds. We all remember the three that were foiled by diligent Americans, the shoe bomber, the underwear bomber and the Times Square bomber. In all of these cases, the crimes charged were those of attempting to kill and conspiring with others to do so. In all three of those cases, alert Americans on transcontinental flights or in the streets of New York City told authorities of bizarre behavior or actually subdued the threats themselves. There was no foiling by the FBI. The plotters were, thankfully, bumbling fools who had poorly planned their criminal behavior and who ended up harming no one. All three are serving life terms. But the more curious cases are the remaining 17 for which the federal government has taken credit. They all have a common and reprehensible thread. They were planned, plotted, controlled, and carried out by the federal government itself. In all of these 17 cases, from the Fort Dix 6 to the Lackawanna 7 to the Portland Parade Bomber, the feds found young men of Muslim backgrounds, loners who were bitter in America. They befriended them, cajoled them, and persuaded them that they could change the world by killing Americans. In all these cases, agents worked undercover and portrayed themselves to the targets as Arabs of like un-American mind. In some cases, the federal agents used third parties to act as middlemen. The third parties were typically persons who had been convicted of crimes and who, in return for leniency at their own sentencings, were willing to work with the same feds who prosecuted them in order to help the feds and trap whomever else those feds were pursuing. Thus, in all 17 of these cases, because of the command and control of federal agents, no one was ever in danger, no one was harmed, no bomb went off, and no property was damaged. But in all those cases, the losers whom the feds targeted each believed that they were interacting with real plotters who would bring them cash and bombs. As we know, sometimes the cash arrived, but the bombs never did. The defendants were essentially charged and convicted for playing a game with federal agents. The most recent of those gener uh, government-generated plots was revealed yesterday. It has a new twist because it allegedly involves agents of the intelligence apparatus of the government of Iran. It, too, was destined to go nowhere, as the feds monitored and taped every move made by their target as he interacted with federal agents whom he stupidly believed to be drug dealers and co-conspirators. 
Today, the feds themselves revealed that high officials of Iran's government knew nothing of this. Of course, the neocons have demanded bombs on Tehran, no matter what the government there knew. And this plot came to light the day before Attorney General Holder himself was subpoenaed by Congress in the Fast and Furious case. You get the picture. Are any of these plots criminal? Can the government just pick and choose whom to seduce and then lower the boom at the right time and arrest its would-be Confederates? Is this a proper and efficient use of law enforcement resources? The answers to these questions are obvious and they are not good. The courts have made this legal so long as the target of these plots had a mental predisposition to cause harm. But none of this keeps us safe. All of this makes us less free as any one of us can be entrapped. And we are fools if we praise the government for exposing a plot of its own creation and saving us from a danger that never existed. Can the government break the law in order to enforce it? Well, when it does, it becomes a law unto itself, and the rule of law dies as the feds decide whom to target and whom to trap. Think about it. Are we really safe in a false sense of security? Why do we pay the government to trick us into believing it is keeping us safe? When no one is harmed and the government controls the plot, Aren't we just punishing someone for his thoughts? And in a free society, aren't free people free to think as they wish? This must be so, because if the government can punish our thoughts, there are no limits to its power. From New York, defending... Okay.